On this video, we're comparing the Nikon Z 404.5 to the Nikon Z 180-600. These are completely different lenses. One's a zoom, one's a prime. But we're going to be looking at the autofocus, the hit rate, the image quality of these lenses, and the color rendition to see what the differences are. Is this lens worth twice the price? Can you use this for bird and wildlife photography versus this? How do they stack up if you're going to pick one lens? So that's what this video is going to be about. So let's talk about it. Well, this morning I'm going to start off with the 4.5. And why is that? Well, a little bit of light gathering. It's pretty overcast up here and it is actually sprinkling a little bit. So I can hear my willow ptarmigan back here. It's not quite bright enough yet to really even take pictures. But we're going to go ahead and see what we can get with this lens real quick. We've had this out here the last couple days, so I've got some little tarming in a little bit better light with both these lenses that we'll look at. Let's get out here and see what we can find, and after we shoot that, we'll do our duck test, and we'll talk about the difference of these lenses on the size, weight, price, uh, the components in them, those type of things. And then we'll talk about what I think about the two and how they work. So let's get after it. not a whole lot of light up here it's really bad light but i got one willow ptarmigan right here there's more they're barking they were kind of chasing each other a while ago so real quickly on the handling of this 404.5 just out shooting it it is an extremely light lens i think it weighs in at 2.7 pounds without the teleconverter you have the teleconverter you're at 3.5 uh, pounds with this lens so in comparison to the 1-800, you're a one pound difference if you're running on both that, you know, they're max reach with the teleconverter on this one and the other one at 600. So it's it's pretty nice and light. Of course, the Z9 is still heavy, you know, so you're still about six and a half pounds or so. Uh, six six point eight, I think, or 6.7, somewhere around there. I'll give you the specs later, but it's nice in that regard to carry around. It's a little lighter, a little bit lighter, but it's not that big a deal to me as far as the one pound difference between the two. If you got the TC on this, that is. As far as the focus and stuff on these Willow Ptarmigan, not a whole lot of light. It does not like these Willow Ptarmigan. This guy right here, it won't find his head. It'll shift behind him every time when I try to hit the autofocus. There's a tree just right of him. If I hit my single point on the very base of that tree, if I try to hit the middle, it won't do it. Then it gets the focal plane, then it sees the bird's eye. So this is an example I was talking about. Get that focus in the closer to that bird and it'll find it. And that's what I have to do. I have to hit a bottom of a tree right next to him right there. Um, the 18600 does the same thing. Seems to be a little bit better at that than this 404.5. 
um, which doesn't make sense. And it's probably anecdotal, right? So it's just, to me, it seems like it was doing a little bit better. But this lens feels good. It, it's uh, one thing I'll tell you now, it does not work on a gimbal at all. Uh, the elements are way here towards the body of the lens in this lens and it's lighter. And the Z, with the Z9 that is, with the Z9, the Z9 is too heavy and it always dips back towards the body on the gimbal. So if you've got this lens, it is hand holdable or you're gonna be on a ball head or something like that, or video head because even a video head is gonna tilt on you. But this one, uh, it, it doesn't balance real well with this lens. So that's the only other thing, but he's not moving. So I may have to, I keep hoping some more, these ones just down below me are gonna fly next to this guy, but I'll tell you, my favorite time of year, I keep telling you that about snow, but this is why. I love willow ptarmigan. They're so funny with their calls and their cackles and their behavior. That's why I love wildlife photography. It's just so peaceful and nice. Uh, he's moving a little bit. Let me get him real quick and I'll finish my thought. See, again, I've got to focus on that tree get him in focus so this is an example of what i was talking about with that snow in the last video so if i get up a little bit higher see how clear he is which is a good shot let me draw my uh, see i don't see, i don't like it when i start getting his feathers because see how gray the snow is here take that shot but if i get it up here see how my snow's getting better and my histograms over to the right that's the exposure like but if i go down a little bit See how he starts getting fuzzy? Because I've got snow in front of me, a berm of snow. So there's really not a happy medium to get his feet blurred out. And that's the problem with this. Oh, that was fun, but the light ain't getting no better. So we're gonna change out to the 180 to 600 now. 4.45 is good, but I ran into a scenario there where Tarmian were in front of me, moving that way, going across the trail. But for me to get in distance where I wasn't going to spook them, they're still kind of spooky because they're running across the trail in front of me. There's about 30 of them. But when I got to that distance, this 404.5, it was just too far because one, the autofocus for those birds is all the autofocus really have a hard time finding the eye or finding that bird at all because they blend into the snow. That's what they're made for. Made to, like a lot of times, I, I've drove by them two through just going up and down the roads looking for them. I've drove by the same spot five times or six times I finally see them because one moved. It moved his head or blinked his eye. If they're just sitting, they're hard to see. And so, autofocus didn't hit a lot there. And a lot of the birds got by me. If I had uh, to the 600 range, or even 500 range, it would have been a little easier to get the birds. I could have focus that area which I did but by the time I did that it was almost too late and they had been big enough in the frame because they're still really small in the frame where I was that time so that's where the 400 to me on birds starts to fall apart if it's not a big bird or you can't get close these guys are like a size of a small chicken so I'm gonna get that lens on real quick so hang on a second while I change that out but now I'm gonna go out here and run this 180 to 600 to shoot it in the same light conditions. We're at the exact same light condition I was before the light came up. So we're gonna go run this lens so we get. Well, unluckily, I couldn't find any more ptarmigan that afternoon. But luckily, the next day, I ran into some ptarmigan in a blowing snow. And then finally, the wind blew, the clouds out, and we had a little bit of sunny sky. And this is how incredibly windy it was. <laughs> oh, God. It's a great morning, just fantastic morning, even with that blast of wind and snow blasting me. Uh, what am I doing today? I, of course, I came up here to test these two lenses out, and I came up here to find Willow Ptarmigan. But when I got up here first this morning, no tracks, no sounds, no nothing. Of course, it was you know still dark, because I wanted to get here before the light comes so I can start listening for them, figure out where they're at. If you watch the videos last year, I talked about how to track them down. So I was kind of a little bit bummed there, but then I started seeing this sky. That's another reason I'm excited today is look at that sky. That's just 
gorgeous as that sun's coming up top of the mountains. You got those clouds, just gorgeous. So getting down low with those tarmac and that wind blowing, uh, the autofocus would lose it from time to time in that. I'm gonna, there it is. So anyway, I'm gonna get out of this go down the hill a little bit see if I can relocate those ptarmigan and uh, get some more shots of them so I will talk to you here in a minute uh That was a lot of fun shooting those ptarmigan. And we'll talk about the experiences of using these two lenses in the field and the differences in the two here after we get done looking at the EVF and the hit rate and the image quality. And to get the autofocus and the hit rate, we went out and did the duck test again. And we ran the 404.5 with and without the teleconverter. And I'm going to show you the EVF footage of this and we'll also look at the hit rate of this. We've already done the 180 to 600, the autofocus and the hit rate, two or three times already. So you don't need to bore you sitting through that again. If you want to see that, go to one of the other videos. But after that, we will do the image quality look at the two lenses, the image quality differences. I really expect the autofocus on this one hit rate to be right on par with the 180 to 600 or maybe a touch better, but it should be right there with it. Let's start with comparison of these two lenses as they are on paper. And the first comparison we'll talk about is this 404.5 without the teleconverter and the 180 600 at 400 millimeters. So we'll go through those. So both of them set to 400 millimeters. The aperture is f6 on the 180 600 and it's 4.5. That's not quite a full stop. It's just a touch over two thirds of stop difference in the light at 400 millimeters. The weight difference in the two lenses is 2.7 pounds, 4.5 pounds. A little over a pound, and a little over a pound and a half, about 1.8, I believe. The length of that is 12 and a half inches versus 9.3 inches. So a little bit of difference there in the length also. The minimum focus distance is 8.2 feet with the 404.5, and you get closer with this one, 6.4 feet minimum focus distance. 
The price of the two lenses, $1,700 versus 3245 Not quite twice as much difference in the price more for this one. So that's one of the things we're looking at considering is, is by these two lenses, is it really worth twice the price? We'll talk about that in a bit. Now let's do the comparison with the 404.5 with the teleconverter attached. So you're at 4.5 aperture, you put the teleconverter on, you're at 6.3. So now both these lenses have the exact same aperture at 560 millimeters versus 600 millimeters. We're just going to do it that way. So the weight of the two lenses now is 4.5 pounds still in this one. This one now goes up to 3.5 pounds once you add the teleconverter on it. It was 2.7 before. So now you're at a pound difference between the two. The minimum focus distance is still 8.2 feet on the 4.5. This one goes up to 7.8 feet. So again, you have a better minimum focus distance on 180 to 600 if that's a concern of yours. Both lenses, I forgot to mention, have an STM motor in them. So they both have the same exact motor and they're both extremely, extremely quiet. So if you're pairing this with a Z9, your weight on this one is 8.4 pounds and this one's 7.4 pounds. So you're still a pound difference, but that would be your weight if you're using a Z9 because I tested these with a Z9. So we'll talk a lot about that balance and feel and all those kind of things. Both lenses have function buttons on them, but the 404.5 has two sets of function buttons plus a memory recall. As far as the switches, both of them have autofocus manual and full to six meters to infinity. Let's make sure this one's six meters. Both of them to turn the VR, to change the VR settings, you still have to do that in camera. All right, now let's get to the autofocus test, the 404.5. And I'm going to just show you the hit rate, the autofocus performance of 404.5. We've had several videos now. We've shown you the autofocus and the hit rate, the 18600. We won't do that in this video. We will show you the image quality difference in the two lenses, but I'm just going to show you the AF and the hit rate of this guy. All right, here we go. Our bird is completely out of focus. Let's see how long this takes. Boom, jumped right to it. Let's run this back and look at it frame by frame. One, two, three four, five, six, six. Yep, six frames. So about what we saw in the other one. So let's move forward, see what else we see. Because this 180-600, we were seeing it about three to six frames. Three, when if you're already in kind of close to the bird, it was two to three frames. And if you're completely out of focus, we're going all the way to the background or coming all the way to the foreground and then finding our duck that's blurred out. That's where we're getting about, you know, around that five average so that's what we saw so far on the first one let's keep going and see what else we see let's go on this one quick let's see how many frames that was one two three four five six on that one so five to six. Ooh, seven's out look at that so go six in focus seven not in focus eight back in focus nine that was interesting so we had a little little drift there. I didn't see that on a 186, or at least I didn't notice it. Um, so that's interesting. Not a big deal. Um, you're still, because we'll watch this in real time, and you'll see how exactly fast it is. Watch. Boom. And it's locked on. You really don't notice that it, it pulsed, but as we go frame by frame, remember, this is one frame out of 24 per second. We're shooting 24 frames a second with the video, so that's what we're getting. We're getting that one little frame kind of wobbled, not a big deal. All right, let's go on. Let's look for another a couple examples, and we'll move on to the hit rate. All right, we're out of focus. Let's see how long these two take. That was pretty quick. So what you'll notice is these are it, jumping right to that eye. Both lenses, so far what I'm seeing is they're acting exactly the same, which what I figured they would with autofocus with these new Z lenses. That same technology is in there with those motors. They're both using STM motors, so I would expect, and same type of motors pretty much, so I'd expect them to act the same. So let's look at this one. One, two, three, four, five. Pretty close in five. Six goes out a little bit. Seven is definitely in. So it's interesting. That's twice we've seen that. So it looks like it's almost focused. The box is not there locking it yet. Not there. And then when it says it's locked, it's locked. It's really good. So it's a little interesting to see that um, little drift right there, in, in and out right there. But again, it's happening quick. I don't, I'm looking for any other drift in here once it says it's locked and I'm not seeing it. Looks good. 
Okay, that's a good example. So now we've got a bird really close to us, and we went all the way to the background. So these ducks are way out of focus. See how bad they're out there? So when I hit the autofocus button, I don't have a box telling me it sees the bird. It's, I'm just seeing which bird's going to grab, and it should be that one closest to me. So we'll see what it does. This is an extreme example from all the way out there, all the way back to all, not the minimum focus, but within 20 feet or so. So let's watch this. All right, let's start counting them. All right, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, where we should have thought we'd see it. But again, we're coming farther back. Seven, almost eight, nine, nine's there. Pretty close to there. Ten for sure is there. And eleven, when the box lit up for a ten. Ten frames on that one, but I'm going all the way out there to all the way here. So it's not quite half a second, so that's really, really nice. Let's watch that back in real time. Okay, completely out, and get ready for it. Boom. So half a second is really nice. To me, the 404.5 without the teleconverter, the autofocus is the same as the 180 to 600. They're both extremely snappy. You get, you know, a quarter of a second to hit focus when you're completely at the back infinity or right at your minimum focus going to the birds. Uh, to sometimes at the worst, from a far rack to a short rack, you know, third of a second, maybe close to half a second. That, that's that's fantastic. I, I love it. So it's working really good. And now let's look at the EVF footage, the 404.5 with a teleconverter attached. Ducks out of focus. Let's find the first frame where it starts. Looks like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Seven's not quite there, even though the box is there. Eight. Yeah, eight on that one. We'll see if that holds. See if we're getting about three more frames in that with that. All right. I want to show you something here real quick. So we're on this duck. We're focused in, and we're going to move over. We didn't change our focal plane. We didn't go all the way back. We just Our focal plane's at that duck. We're going to move to another duck, and we'll see how quickly it hits that next duck when you're already close to that focal plane. So let's move over here. And there's our duck. So I haven't hit the autofocus yet. See the white box is on it now. It got smaller. Thinks the beak is the eye. I haven't hit it yet, it looks like. Still haven't hit it. Okay, I must have hit it here. Yeah, I hit it. So I hit it right here. So one, two frames. What it shows in. Three. Those look good. There, that's what I was wondering about. So you see it drift. And I'm still holding it down because the box is still gold. And then it goes to the body, red. Back to the head in focus. So we had a little drift there. I thought that was really interesting when I saw that in the EVF footage. Again, let's watch it in real time. It, If you're hitting the shutter at that same time, which it looks like I, I may have been, we'll see here in just a second. Uh, you would get out of focus shots in there. Let's look at it in real time. See, in real time, I didn't notice that it went out of focus. And that's when you review your images, you look at it and go, oh, why do I have a couple that were blurry here? Or is it motion blur? Is it out of focus? Well, what happened? What it looks like to me, what it did, it was in focus and it said something's not right. And it said, I'll go to the other focus method, which is just the area. That's why I got the red box and it right back it. But it was just one frame. So that this stuff, that computation is happening extremely fast. But in real time, you can't notice it. Let's do it one more time, show you in real time. If you had a quick eye, you can see the red dot. But you, other than that, seeing it going out of focus, you didn't notice it. But that's why sometimes you'll see it go out. That's what drift is. And with the we didn't see it without the telecomber. I didn't see it. I've reviewed a lot more AVF footage that I'm showing you with all these lenses. But this is this is the ones I saw it happen a few times with the teleconverter. I didn't really see it much with the. I did see a couple times drift, and I saw it with this one too, the one in six hundred. But with the TC, I'm seeing a little bit more of it. Let's see if we find any, any more for you. All right. Now, this example here will show you. And I saw this a little bit more with the teleconverter in this situation. This is a tough situation where ducks really hunker down in the water. And the duck has more muted colors like this. 
So it sees a duck. I haven't hit the autofocus yet. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, four. We're in. So four, we're in. We're in at four. But watch what happens. On six, it goes out there and says, "Oh, I don't. That's not the duck I want. The reflection's the duck." This is what happens sometimes. Autofocus gets confused. Now the duck's out of focus. It's trying to focus in the water. So let's see how many frames that was. That's one, two, three frames. So two frames it says, but it says, hey, something's not right. Go to the other autofocus mode. Here's where it goes into the auto area focus mode. So let's back. It says one, two, three to the other one, four, five, six. Probably on seven, six, it says, oh, I found my duck again. It's not in focus, but seven, eight. Seven is in focus. Then it goes back again to the head in the water. Goes the eye, the autofocus is out, still out, back to the head, back to the other autofocus mode with the red box, gold box. So this one was really confused. See, so it goes back to the other area mode, still there, it's on the body, doesn't go back to the head. That eye is prominent, and there it goes back to the head. Not sure why I saw that. I didn't, you know, it doesn't happen all the time. Okay, this is one of those where you can see in this EVF footage the colors of the water, the reflections of the water. I'm a little overexposed for this image, but the eye is pretty prominent and contrasty here. But it was getting lost between the reflection and just really didn't want to find that head. And it did happen from time to time. Now, again, it's not all the time, just a few times I noticed with the teleconverter. But again, as I said, all these lenses will do this at times, but I just saw it more often with the teleconverter. Let's move on, see what else we can find. All right, that's a good example. So, one, two, three, four, close, five, out, six, see? I saw that time to time with this teleconverter, and I did see it without the teleconverter too, so it's real interesting, so let's show that again. One, two, three, four, five. See how it goes out? Six. So it's back in at six, but let's back this up again. Watch it. One, see, one, two, three, four goes out, five back in. So three is not in focus, but it's close to focus. I expect the next frame to be in focus, but the next frame goes back out again. Five comes right back to where it was at three, and then six is locked on the body. It's not locked the head. Seven, eight, nine, ten. See how long it takes to find the head? Eleven, twelve, twelve. When it finally found the head. And I don't see it going to the eye at all, but it's going to the head. Now, the autofocus conclusion of these two before we go to hit rate. Without the teleconverter, they both act pretty close to the same. The only difference I saw in this 404.5 was I saw sometimes when it would get one frame from fixing to lock the autofocus, it would go back out the other way and then come back to where it was and then get the lock. Only a couple times did I see it where it had lock and then it drifted. It was always right at the very beginning when it grabbed lock one or two frames, then drifted, then came right back within one or two frames. We did see one or two times where it went crazy it got lost but when you watch it back in real time you see us really fast i mean you about can't see it unless you're really paying attention to see something happen funny you really don't see the out of focus when you put the teleconverter on this guy it still acts really really well again these acquisitions are extremely fast we're talking five to ten frames out of 24 frames a second so that's what we're looking at but we did see with the teleconverter that we had a little bit more drift. We saw that really weird drift where three to five frames in, it would get one frame from fixing to be in lock focus, and then it drifts out for a frame or two. Then it comes back to that one, then gets there. But again, it's happening really fast. If you watch it back in real time, you about can't see it happen, but it is happening. Well, what does that translate to? Well, we'll look at the hit rate real quick and just see what that translates to. What I expect to see it as when that little drift hits, if it sort of got locked, you probably see three or four frames that kind of went out of focus. And it happens. And But it's happening really, really fast. Will that hinder your day? Will it make your day bad? Do you get a lot of bad shots? No, you're just going to get a few 
shots that drifted out when you get drift. So that's what the AF is on the 404.5. Okay, let's look at a couple bursts of the 404.5 without the teleconverter. Let's look at the hit rate of it. I expect it to be about like the 18600 should be great. We really didn't have really much drift. A couple times so a little bit, but not a big deal. So let's look at this burst. The first frame looks like it's more on the shoulder, not the eye. Second one, the same thing. Third one, fourth one looks good. It's on the eye. So out of those four in that burst, the real quick burst, the last one was in. Let's look at the next one. So he's got a shoulder turn, no head. It looks really great. It looks like it's right across the back of the neck and the back. It looks good. Looking good. Looking good. Still locked on good. It's locked on that shoulder. It's pretty easy. So let's look here as the next burst. So the first frame is out. It's it's good. It's acceptable, but it's it's on the shoulder, not critical on the eye. The so second one, still thing. Third one, it's in. So took a second to get there. Went from shoulder to eye to head. Still in. That one right there is a little back of the shoulder a little bit, but still very acceptable. But yeah, that's it. And those three examples are pretty reminiscent and typical of what I saw this lens without the teleconverter. May have a couple frames out at the beginning, may lose one in the middle or two in the middle, but that's what I expect. I expect it to act like the 18600, and it did. They pretty much acted the same, which they should because they're both Z-mount lenses on Z-mount body, same body. Same type of STM motors inside. The only difference is how the lens construction as far as the elements and how they work is different. And one's a prime and one's a zoom. Now let's look at the 44.5 with a teleconverter attached and see what the hit rate is on that. All right, let's go to the first image here. So when you're out here, the full image, everything looks good. You come in, you see already that it hit the shoulder, not the eye. Let's keep going, still. And three. One, two out, three's in. Let's see what we got, still in, look good. All right, let's look at this little batch here. This one looks like it is there. Even if it hit the shoulder, the way its head position is, we're there. All right, and let's see what we got. So we look like we're dropped out a couple right, right in there. Those two frames were out on the eye, but they're still acceptable on the bird. Looking for anything that's out, okay. So that last frame is out. Well, the very last one. So just the last frame there. So it was a couple in the middle that were not critical, but they were still acceptable. This one here wouldn't be acceptable to me. It's out, the very last frame. So here's a little duck that was really close to the water. Look at the hit rate. And this is where you can see a little bit of problem with the teleconverter here. So we're in, we're out, we're out, back in, in, out, way out. So. Yeah, that was probably 50%. So that's one where they're, when they get the head down like that, on a duck like that that's muted, that's what you'll get. All right, let's look at this little burst here. First one's in, second one's close to in, but not quite. Third one's out, fourth one's in. We're in, we're in. Good. So we had one out of those that was out. All right, let's look at this girl here. Really pretty girl. Uh, it is actually locked a little behind the head. It looks like the most critical focus is back here on her neck. Let's move forward. All right, it moved forward now. Now we're in these feathers, the beak, and the head here. I won't fault any of this because her eyes are closed, but it still should be fine in the head on the bird. Out. Back in. So... Yeah, that was probably 80% on that one. Again, difficult situation because the bird, you get the back of the bird to us, which it could hit the body and not get the head. Looked like it tried to lock the head, but it was locking the neck more than it got the head. All right, let's look at this little burst. Looks good right here. Now, this is your good conditions here. Got some light. No real reflections of the bird in here, a little bit, but not much. The bird's head and its shoulders and its body are in the same exact where you have critical focus in that. So if it hit the body or the head, it's going to get focus. This is what you kind of look for, that bird sitting that way. And so they're in, 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 
Yeah, all in. There's only five in there. This one here got her head tucked. It is pretty much there. Uh, it's not really a critical focus on the eye because it's hitting the body and it's getting the side of the head and the eye, but it's still really, really good. Again, we're at 100%, remember, so that's... <laughs> I want to let you know that's not the whole thing. It was that close. I expect to hit everything, but that's what we got going on. We're zoomed in 100%. We're nitpicking. Oh, the colors in this one look really good. These are all raw, unprocessed images, guys. Remember that, okay? So we are in, because that beak is really clear. Next one, we're in, 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 like the reflection, in. So those are all in. This one starts off in, goes out at four. It's on the head. That's really nice. It actually hit the body there briefly, then it jumped to the head when the head moved away. We're going to figure to go to the body, so it did really well. All right, let's look at this guy. We are on the body, but close enough to the head. We've got enough depth of field. It looks like it's okay. Close enough, the beak's out. There we go. So now we're getting better. There, now we're in. So the first three were not there. Four was there. And we'll look at the last duck. Good. Good. No, we're not. One, two is not. Three is. Sometimes I think I'm good until I get to the one that looks really good. So three's in. Four went back to the body. Five's going back to the head. Not there. Then it's there on six. Seven there. Stay in there. Went back to the body, back to the head, two frames later. Back on the head. Back to the part of the body. Way on the body. All right, that's enough looking at those images. I think you kind of got the idea of what's going on. With the TC, it's really good, but you will see a little bit of drift sometimes. And I don't know why, because uh, primes always handle the telecovers really well. But you are adding a different communication layer inside there between the lens and the body. But it's still extremely, to me, extremely, extremely acceptable. So synopsis, autofocus, hit rate. Both act a lot like each other as far as autofocus and hit rate. When you add the teleconverter to get it closer to this 600 millimeters, that's where it has a little bit of fall off where the 180 is a touch better with that, with this guy, the teleconverter. But... They're both incredibly good, even with the teleconverter in this guy. It's, it's more than acceptable. With the autofocus on birds, is great with this, with the teleconverter without. But if you're going to say and compare the two, apples to apples, without the TC, they're pretty close to each other. With the TC, I did see a little drift. I just had a little weird one-frame thing with this lens sometimes. It was odd. So now let's look at image quality of the two lens, color rendition, things like that. Covey it again, I talked about earlier. When I had this lens out, I had light cloud cover, a little bit of sun coming through, so I had a nice soft box effect, which basically that sun's going through the layer of clouds. You can't really see the sun. You may see a kind of a brighter ball through the clouds, but it's working like a soft box, so I have no shadows. So I had pretty, for Alaska, decent conditions to shoot this lens in. Once I got this lens on, the clouds moved in. I had rain clouds, gray clouds. I was getting really very little light diffuse coming through and I had rain, so keep that in mind. But we should be able to see, still see the colors and the rendition, but what you're gonna see with the 4 and 4.5, it's gonna look more vibrant because of that good light reflecting off these birds. All right, let's look at this one first. Look at image quality when he's got his head turned. And what I'll say real quick, we're, and this, this is the image here, and we zoom in to 100%. The image quality is great. The feather detail, the colors in this are just great. I mean, look at the rich colors, the reflections with the shadows in here, the details, the browns. I, I like all of that. I like the colors that are coming out of this lens, which I should at the price point, and this being a prime, I'd expect to see this. See some other images here in a second. All right, here we go. Let's get the one that's really in focus. Here you go. So again, it's on that eye. I, I like the colors in here. The, the color rendition is really good on this lens. And the image quality, the detail is really good. Both lenses are, are sharp. 
but this looks really good. I like the color rendition of that. It looks really good. And we knew it is. We've seen you've seen enough reviews of this. If you've used this lens or rented it like I have, I've used it quite a bit. Not just this test. I've used it many other times and taken it out. I like it. We'll talk about the handling and what I think of the two lenses here after we get done with this image quality. But the image quality on this lens is really good. Like I said, I love the color rendition on this lens. It looks great. So now let's look at the teleconverter version of it, because that's what you really probably want to know. How does it perform a teleconverters? Let's look at this one first. So here's this duck. Again, good light. And this one, it looks a little flatter in this image. There could be a lot of things going on. It could be exposure in those. But we are in focus and everything, but we're a little overexposed. You can tell because I blew out the tail, which I really wasn't as worried about that. I was trying to keep my exposures the same between the two lenses, what I was expecting to have. But this one looks a little flatter for some reason. And in this one, you can see these colors here. What I will tell you, though, is because I'm looking at the same parts of the bird, these reds and oranges you get in this feather in here, the detail, doesn't look as vivid. And it's nitpicking. It's real small. It doesn't look as vibrant as it did without the teleconverter. It looks a little muted. But looking at the here and all these blacks and, and the feather details still looks good. Again, that's the image before I zoomed in. Let's move on to the next one. So here's a, probably a tough example. And again, the colors look really good to me, but without the teleconverter, they look a little more vivid and a little more contrast in oranges to the, to the reds and the oranges. I want to show you this last image here. And to me, this one looks good. And I'll tell you why here in just a second. And this is my favorite image I took of the day. I think of it, the ducks as far as the way they look. And it's made because it's water and the light was glistening off that and the colors. But I'm going to compare it against that, this other one to show you why that one looks better. Let's get them both up. So what's happening here with these two images? Why does this one on the left look better than the one on the right? As far as if you look here at the contrast in the colors of this bird, and it's right here, it's the f-stop. On the one on the right, I'm at 6.3 is what the most wide open aperture is with a teleconverter. I stopped it down to f8, and that's what I got. And by doing that, that's what helps teleconverters a lot. You see it more on the zooms where you definitely need to stop down with zooms a lot of times. But with primes, usually with the one fours, you don't have to stop down. But I did notice with this lens that if I stop down from 6.3 to f8, I got a lot better contrast and image quality out of the birds than I did when I was shooting at 6.3. So by stopping down with this lens with the TC, it seemed to be a lot better image quality out of it. And that is, to me, that image quality of that one, if you look at the beak and the feathers and the colors, it's a lot better. So there's the image quality of that guy. So now let's look at the 18600 image quality so you kind of see these back to back in the same video. Okay, let's look at this girl here first. Again, now you'll see, look at all the rain on the back of this bird. But here we are. This bird's a little bit closer in. So we're really nitpicking in here. Look at this one. But it is the eyes sharp. You can see the trees in there, that. And the colors look really good. Look really good. And I don't have to stop down. I can shoot 6.3 with this because when I TC on this one, I have to stop down. But that looks really good. The colors are really good. I still think this lens has a little more contrast than a lot of the other lenses I've been using lately. And you can see it really in this image. Let's jump ahead because I'm at, I had to drop down to 1 200th second, 3200 ISO. I wasn't shooting that high with this one. I was shooting a lot faster shutter speed, too. All right, here's this guy. This one, the focus is not perfect. The focus is actually right here on the front of his head. But what I wanted to show you in this one is the colors. Uh, I like these. I'm talking about the more contrast, the more richer colors, and I'm seeing that here with the purples and the greens. Let's move on to another image. Here we go. So this bird's really close, and we get in here. The detail in the image quality on the 180 to 600 is great. Look, there's a water drop. I can see everything in this bird's head. But the bird is so close to me that what is in focus is right here at his eyes, the ridge of his head. This tip of the beak falls out and the back of the head falls out because the bird was getting there within 12, 15 feet of me. 
but the detail is incredible, especially shooting one two fifty a second at 5,000 ISO. That's what I was shooting on this image here. And that looks good. So the image quality, I think, is really good. The colors, the contrast. Let's move on to another one. I think this one's the same one where I'm just talking about the colors in this one. Again, real rich here, real rich here. It may be a little richer than some people like. Some people may want to shoot a flatter profile, but I think that looked really good. And this one here, for sure, just wanted to show you the colors. It's in focus. Again, bird's closer to me, so the focus plane is right here on top of his head. So this part of his chest in here and this part of his head in here is in focus, and the beak goes out and the back goes out. But what I wanted to point out was this in here, the colors that are in here. So really rich, really vivid in there. Again, crap light, 250 second, 5,000 ISO, 600 millimeters at 6.3. But the colors look good on the 180-600. So this is the last image to look at, the 180-600. And what I wanted to point out was here, as far as image quality, is the droplets of water on the beak and across here in the shoulder and the colors that are in here just look great. The focus is here on the eye, but again, they're, they're close enough to me where you know it, it, part of it will be in, part will be out because that plane is so small. But, but I just wanted to point out how clean and crisp. You can see all the water, all the feather detail and everything in that bird. So the image quality of these two lenses, and we'll talk one little more bit about image quality when we get to talk about the handling and use in the field of these two lenses when I went out and shooting the ptarmigan and stuff like that. But the image quality of the 404.5 is great. Outstanding image quality of this lens. We knew that already. And there's enough reviews out there about this lens about image quality. It is great. What you do when you put the TC on though, it gets a little touch flatter in the profile, just a little bit, not a ton, but just a little bit, where I lose what I really liked out of this lens prior with that TC. But stop down from 6.3 to f8, that goes away. It gets looking like it was without the teleconverter. So my advice when using this lens with the teleconverter is stop down to f8, and you'll get a lot better image quality. As far as the 18600, we've seen a lot of images even here. Great image quality, great color rendition to me. If you compare the two with this guy without the teleconverter, it edges it out just a little bit, not a ton. I still believe this lens has more color contrast in it than this lens. That may not be your cup of tea. You may want it a little flatter like this lens gives you. But both of them are good image quality, but this one just a little bit edges it out. And it's because it's got a little different glass in it, so it should edge it out a little bit. And it's a prime, right? Primes should always outdo a non-prime lens. But it's still really, 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 really close. Once you put the TC on, though, that's where I feel like without stopping down at 6.3, I like the 180 to 600 a little bit better at 600 millimeters or 560 millimeters. But again, that's more aesthetic pleasing to me. It may not be to you, but that's what I saw. But once I stop this lens down, it's right back where it was, where this was just a touch better than this one was as far as image quality. Now, again, this was being shot in much better light. I didn't just compare that day when I was doing the comparison of these two with the TC on and off. I looked at other images with this lens on a better day, and and that's kind of what I saw was with the TC, no stop down. I kind of like the 180 a little bit better, but once I stopped this lens down, this one kind of edged out just a touch as far as image quality and color rendition. But it's so close. I'd have no problem with either one of them. All right, now let's get into the handling and use of these two lenses. We'll talk about what my experience has been on these two lenses over the period that I've used them over the quite a while. I've used that one for almost a year on and off, and this one quite a bit recently. The very first thing about the 404.5 that I don't like about it, it is not a gimbal lens to use with the camera with a Z9 and a gimbal. This guy is too light in the front end and it will always dip back to the body. You cannot get this thing balanced. The only time you can get it almost balanced, you move that foot so far back, the Arca Swiss plate, that is touching the Z body lens, and then it still wants to dip back quite a bit. And once you put the teleconverter on, which is probably what you want to do when you want to put it on a gimbal, is once you put the teleconverter on, you can't balance it at all. It's always body heavy down. If you're using a lighter body, the Z6, Z7, Z8, 
Without the teleconverter, this guy will balance, but again, you're pushing that so far back, almost touching the body with the, with the Arca Swiss plate when you move it back this way. But once you put the teleconverter on again with those, it dips down again where it, it's going back heavy again. So it's really not good on a gimbal or a fluid head at all that I've found with this lens. It's more of you're going to handhold this lens if you're going to use it. Video and stills for image stabilization, both these lenses is great. Uh, shooting video with both of them is really, really nice. Um, with and without the teleconverter, this one and this one, uh, it, they are stable, very rock solid stable. Now, on to 400 millimeters with this lens. To me, for what I do where I shoot here in Alaska, for the type of animals, the birds and stuff I shoot, 400 millimeters is not in that sweet spot for 80% or 70 or 60% of what I do. So it's not, this is why I don't own this lens, but I rent it and borrow it all the time. I like this lens, I just can't make myself buy it because of this. It's either too much lens on a moose or something, or it's not enough lens when I'm shooting birds. So a case in point with the ptarmigan yesterday. When I was first shooting them, they were close enough for 400 millimeters was pretty good and acceptable. And then when they moved on me, and then when I was reacquiring them, they're on the right side of the trail, and they're going to start crossing in front of me. And this is the prime ones when I, I've got part of the flock on my left, part of the flock on my right. That's when I can get them get a running across or flying across me. That's what I'm really looking for. So when they started to cross, I've got to figure out what distance I can get to these birds without spooking them. So I kind of look at them, see what their behavior is. I kind of creep forward. And when they look a little like they're not liking it too much, then I, that's where I stop. That's my distance where I can keep that buffer where the birds are not going to change their behavior. I'm not really changing their behavior. And they're not going to spook off. That's the worst thing to happen. So I get down, lay down in the snow, trying to shoot these birds as they're crossing the trail in front of me. And I'm looking through this guy at 400 millimeters, and I'm going, I wish I had my 500 F4, the teleconverter on this guy, or the 180 to 600, or the 600 F4, something. I wanted, I needed more reach. They were just small in the frame because they didn't just cross in front of me. They were crossing away from me, so they were getting farther away. And there's no way I can get my teleconverter out of the bag or, and then put it on this lens and take it apart because by then the birds are out or I've spooked them by all that extra movement. So with 400, I always want to have the teleconverter or another lens with me to cover that longer range. And in the heat of the moment, changing out a teleconverter is not going to work for you. So 400, and I've shot 400 a lot. No, I prior to getting a mirrorless, my main lens I shot before I had my 500 to 4 was a 100 to 400 lens. And all the time I was like, oh, I need more reach that 1 400. So I ran a 1 400 with a teleconverter most of the time. But running a teleconverter on a 404.5 and having to be at 6.3 f8 for this price of lens is where it, it just doesn't work for me. So 400 to me is kind of a, it's not in the sweet spot. Now, if you say, oh, you would have a 400 28. Yes, I would. But the reason I have the 400 28 is because of 28. That's why. And the glass on the 500s, 400s, and the 600s, the big lenses, the glass in those lenses do something special to the foreground and background of the bouquet and the image quality. When you shoot one of those lenses for the first time, because that's what happened to me, I shot a 600 f4 for the first time, borrowed a friend, because she had her 300 2.8 she's using with the with the 1.4, and I, I she said, here, use a 600 f4 she had in the truck. First time I shot it, it's like, yeah, I'm getting an f4 or 2.8, one of these big lenses, and never look back. I love it. But that's, to me, about 400, why it kind of bothers me a little bit. And also, if you own this lens, yeah, you're definitely going to be buying the teleconverter for this lens, 1.4. To me, in my opinion, why would you pick one of these lenses over the other ones? Well, reasons I would pick this lens if I was a shooter. I'd be picking this lens because of the weight. And that's the main thing on this guy, the weight. The weight of this lens and the image quality that it has is what makes this lens what it is. So Nikon, a lot of people want a light, hikeable lens. They have a lighter camera body like a Z8 or Z7, Z6 or something like that. And this is the lens they like to use for their good quick walk around lens. And if you 
shoot somewhere where you have more bigs or bigger birds or you can get close to your birds or you want to rock the TC on this guy all the time, then that's where this lens a lot of people like and want to use. For me, if, if these two lenses are sitting here, even if I got the TC, which of these two lenses I'm going to pick up to just go about a walk about where I don't really know where I'm going to shoot that day? I'm going to pick the 180 to 600. I know you might say you're crazy, but I, I don't think so. The reason is, is I have a lot more flexibility in this lens. I can go all the way back to 180 out to 600. The sharpness and image quality of these two lenses is very, very close. Yes, this one edges out a little better. And sometimes it may give you a little extra special something and some detail, a little bit more, a little bit more in the color. But that's nothing that I can't I'll probably get back in post if, if I don't see it in this one. But that's what this one does. There's, to me, there's more flexibility in here. 400 millimeters is not in that sweet spot. There's times, yeah, I could be running a 400 millimeter, like the 1 to 400 or this one, and do fine with shots. The added IQ, the speed sharpness 400 is, it's, it's, to me, it's, again, not really worth the almost double in price for my shooting needs. Because my shooting needs are different than a guy that shoots in Florida. A guy in Florida, this lens may be the one he wants all the time. 400 may be where he wants to sit. He may be shooting more herons and stuff like that that he can get in the right distance to. Or maybe they're a more environmental type shooter with the, you know, the animals aren't as big in the, the frame. They want to get more of the seascape and the animals and birds. So it depends on where your focal range is for what you shoot and what kind of shooter you are. So I can't really say to anybody out there, pick this lens or pick this lens. All I can do is tell you what the difference of the two lenses are and what I find from shooting. So one thing I'll leave you with here at the end was when I shot the Ptarmigan, this 18600 outperformed the 400.5 when I was shooting. Now, they weren't at the exact same time I was shooting them because I can't run out in both lenses chasing Ptarmigan when I'm hiking snowshoes up the side of a mountain. So they were at different times, but what I'll show you is this outperformed it. It worked better with the autofocus because the autofocus really has a hard time finding that eye of the animal. I'll have a whole video out about these ptarmigan and stuff you'll see later, but it really has hard because all it sees the eye in that. I had a little more blowing snow with this one than I did with this one, but the lighting conditions were exactly the same. So let's look at a couple of these 4.5 images here, and we'll try to find a good one here. So here's the 404.5 with the ptarmigan. It's pretty close to what I got the other day. And what I did notice was I wasn't getting as much detail out of these feathers. And you'll see right here how the autofocus went out there for a couple, and it will lose it. But there are good images in there. And this one's really good. This one came out good. But you see how it's a little out of focus here and there. So the autofocus really struggles with this. And here we go. Here's another good one. So this is a burst when they were down. I was down low. These are what I look for with ptarmigan shots. I like getting that blur, that snow in the background like that. Let's move forward, look at some different images. There you go. So here's the image when it zoomed out. And this is the problem I had. If I had the 600, it'd look more, you know, I could have done more stuff like that. But it went at 400, it's what I've got. It's not a bad shot, but that's what I'm getting. But I'm getting more birds in the shot. Well, it's weird. I was trying to focus on this guy, but the focus locked on this guy over here. Again, decent detail and stuff, but it's just, this is probably the best detail I had out of them. But it's not really what I was after. This was a good shot, but that's what I got out of that. So let's look at a few of the images from the 180 to 600, why I say it outperformed it. And there's a lot of it because of that focal range. And the, the autofocus worked a little better in the snow. So well, here you'll see this bird first. Here's at 600 millimeters. The compression you get is 6.3. Again, with this lens, the 404.5, I would have been shooting at f/8 to get the same type of contrast in the image. Let's look at another shot here. I got so many good shots on this day. So watch these. Here's where he shakes his butt. So these here just look great. You can see all the detail I'm getting, more detail in the bird. Like I said, exact same light conditions. And just at 600 millimeters, I could 
get better focus. And this lens tends to, for some reason, with that white, wanted to focus better than this one did at 404.5, even if I was close enough to that bird. And of course, the wind kicked up while I was shooting this one earlier. And that's that's not rolling shutter lean. That is actually the wind blowing, even blowing the bird sideways. And a couple more images, we are done, then we'll get the final wrap up on this thing. See, I love these right here where I'm pricking through the snow, just the head on the ridge. And the image just looks more pleasing to me. That's my synopsis of this. Hopefully those little ptarmigan images in that kind of give you a little kicker at the end. Yes, this is a lot more lens than this lens. But for me, if I was going to grab one, if I had to grab one for the day, this is the one I'd pick up and go with. Well, I hope you found this video helpful. And if you did, please like, subscribe, share, leave me comments about everything. Tell me about if you own these two lenses, what you think of them. Uh, these are just my opinions, not telling you which one to buy. But that's my testing, my experience with these two lenses. And as always, guys, uh, until next time, get outside, go run that shutter. Mm -hmm.